fourth. Hello. Good evening, everybody. And the Twitch first. Hello. Yeah, absolutely. It's that one. <laughs> That would be science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and arts. Thanks, Psy Warrior, who says that you guys couldn't hear one word that I just said. Apparently, I was muted. We were for a portion. Oh, we're not yeah. now we're not. All right, awesome. Thanks, Psy. Great, great sound check. She's checking me. All right, so let's get into our interview section. And I think we're going to start off with uh, Maida. Let's go into a little bit of your educational background. I want people to know who you are, what you do, and why you're sitting here talking to us. Sure. Yeah, no, I could talk all day about that. Um, I guess for me, it started, my mom uh, was a lawyer and she worked at IBM when I was growing up. So I always uh, really looked up to her. Uh, and likewise, my grandmother went to law school. And so I just thought it was the bee's knees watching my mom come home every day and um, talk about working at such a big tech company. So I followed in her footsteps. I went to UNC, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which is the local big public school in North Carolina. I got a philosophy degree in undergrad specializing in um, Platonism, which is Greek philosophy, ancient, uh, because I expected to go to law school and they tend to score really highly on the LSATs, which are the you know exams you need to take to get into law school. Graduated from, or wait, <laughs> Uh, after I graduated uh, from undergrad, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew that I didn't want to be bored and I wasn't ready to go to law school yet. So I, um, I just dragged my feet. I, I visited my family in Iran um, on my dad's side, and I got really lucky. I happened to meet, just talk on Reddit about Star Wars or something. Uh, someone who worked at Escapist Magazine, uh, which is one of the larger games review sites, uh, and got in for an interview and got hired as their community manager as my first job out of undergrad, which uh, I didn't even know what a community manager was when I was applying, <laughs> so I'm super lucky that I got the job because I did not properly sell myself in the interview. Uh, but I worked there for two and a half years, uh, learned to be an editor, um, worked under a lot of really awesome, uh, strong women like uh, Susan Ardent, who worked at Joystick and now I think is at Games Radar Plus, and Janelle Bonanno, who was the executive director of the Video Game Bar Association, and now is like a brand uh, director, probably not the right title, uh, does brand work at Wizards of the Coast now. But anyway, so I, I worked there. Other people there were also attorneys and reminded me of how much I I still was really passionate about arguing with the community about our code of conduct. <laughs> so I um, just silently submitted my application uh, and 
got into law school and it really broke my heart to have to put in my notice because working at a games magazine is like a dream job I never even thought to dream of. Uh, and so, yeah, I was really lucky at my law school. I talked my way into uh, getting an introduction to the general counsel at Epic Games, where I ended up working for um, two and a half years, roughly, on and off um, throughout law school, sh um, shadowing their in-house counsel. And during that time, I also met Ryan Morrison, who's the video game attorney. He was just starting off his practice, um, and so basically the summer I wasn't at Epic, I, I was Ryan's first hire as an intern. Uh, continued to develop my relationship with him, and then when I graduated this past May, his law firm had grown to the point where they were ready to extend their first official offer. So I was his first hire, like, again, um, which, of course, has sentimental value to me. <laughs> Uh, and so now I'm a few months into being an attorney, uh, working out of Raleigh, North Carolina, working specifically on um, primarily video game law. So dream come true totally from the beginning. <laughs> uh, it seems like you had a clear direction and knew what you wanted to do as far as going to law school from a very early age. Um, and I think a lot of people, especially when they're in high school, have no clue what they want to do, right? Or, or at least feel like they have one or two choices. Um, do you feel like it was because of your parents that you felt that you were so secure in making that choice? Yes and no. So I would say Definitely yes, in the sense that I thought it was possible because we were not always well off before my mom graduated from law school. Uh, and so uh, a lot of, you know, my peers or family members uh, definitely didn't see that as a possibility. Whereas from a very early age, I knew, you know, some people, especially women in my family had gotten these terminal degrees. And so it at least was part of my my language, you know, from an early age, considering it as a real possibility, whether I would or not, like not whether I could or not. So I feel like that's really important. Although I will stress that my mom never uh, pressured me to go to follow in her footsteps. Uh, it was mostly actually everyone else that would just say, wow, you're so much like her. You are going to be a great attorney too. And while I don't know if that'll end up being true, I really, I really, hoped it and worked to accomplish it. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's amazing that you had that much support in your household because sometimes you get a split decision on the parents or you just don't know what you want to do. So you're pretty driven and uh, that's admirable. Oh, I will say they were uh, not thrilled when I was doing my time as a video game journalist because it's really hard to, I mean, it, especially because, you know, at least with a video game lawyer, you can say, well, but I'm a lawyer. Uh, but when you're uh, a game journalist, you know, every games industry job conversation starts with justifying that you work in games. And so when your follow-up is, yeah, and I'm, you know, writing content online that I'm really passionate about, uh, it, it's a lot harder of a sell to make. But at the same time, um, yeah, I definitely was raised to be independently minded enough to, to feel like it was <laughs> an option. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Resolve. Let's um, Thank you. Meta, we talk an uh, awful lot about esports on this show. Um, and something that's kind of come up is, you know, the need maybe for like a players union. Um, do you think that esports players would be benefited by a sort of players union? And do you think this would be well received by the industry as a whole? I think that topic comes up a uh, a lot not just in this area but just in athletics in general because um there are so many concerns about uh the vulnerability of the people that are kind of the revenue generators right you have these often children um teenagers coming in and, and pulling in six-figure salaries sometimes and uh and you know their parents are involved as well and in, in a lot of these things and you have the company involved and team owners and just a lot of different interests um, coupled with these potentially very vulnerable people. So uh, I would say, you know, I would say, you know, that definitely is an area that needs more attention. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were developments in that field in the very near future, especially, um, you know, of course, I have to mention 
we're all focused on what happened at BlizzCon today, this big announcement about, um, did you guys hear about... The Overwatch League. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're changing the structure of their, their leagues to be more like, you know, the NFL or other athletic institutions, which is really interesting. You know, I don't know how much I can say because I'm sure, I, I am sure that our, our firm is involved in some respects. Um, but... Uh, because those fields also have a lot of questions about, you know, how how the practice is being run and, and whether people are all being treated fairly, I think uh, there definitely is a need for more scrutiny in the process, especially as the money continues to increase because our, our industry is, you know, not just the fastest growing, but also already, I think, the largest revenue generator amongst other digital media forms. So I think this is only going to become more important, uh, especially as these games are just exploding in popularity. And so many other studios are also joining in these practices and attempting to get their, um, you know, name in. Like, for example, at Epic, we just released, and I can't say we anymore, <laughs> uh, Epic just released Paragon recently, which is, you know, another hopefully big rising esport game and also another local game lawbreakers mm -hmm. there's just so many studios especially here that are focusing on um on that just because they see it as uh, a viable new growing maybe i guess the the biggest um sector of our industry right now i would agree it's so hard to predict uh how it's going to go though and i hate to make any kind of blanket statements i mean that's the lawyer in me but also right. you know People are, it's always down to, often down to individuals, whether people are, you know, in the right or the wrong in any situation. So I think more transparency is always going to be beneficial to those processes. What makes, I think, esports and games unique is uh, nobody owns basketball itself, uh, but people definitely own these franchises and how that's going to play out in the future with these models of wanting to have, you know, global, uh, more publicly involved uh, processes. It's really exciting and, and terrifying all at the same time in, in the best way. Yeah, definitely. So my question to you as obviously someone who's involved in it from a legal aspect um, what are the three big issues that you see in terms of esports? Oh, well, I think, um, you know, besides this question of, you know, uh, unionizing, the other one that came to mind when I, you know, we were first, I was first thinking about agreeing to do this talk was uh, the everything that's going on with CSGO and all the issues about gambling. Um, not that, you know, that is going on there, but there's so many questions about it right now as far as, like, um, creating marketplaces around digital products and then having them be, you know, potentially exportable back into cash. Um, and then knowing that you have a lot of kids playing games, um, you know, to what extent is every company responsible for, you know, what's being done or, you know, being directly involved and, you know, how directly are they profiting and to what extent do they know it? You know, it's, I, I just think that that is all very interesting. And I'm, I'm again, terrifiedly watching it play out on the sidelines. Um, and I think the third thing is just general education. And this applies to indie devs and indie devs and maybe just the majority of the industry. That's not traditional AAA uh, in-house development is knowing that you need to consult with an attorney before signing away legal rights. Um, and that sounds really obvious, but again, like so many of the people involved in this are getting involved from such a young age, or they're coming at it from a, a tech industry background where, you know, our, our default is how can we do it quicker, cheaper, more efficiently. Uh, and so traditionally legal services are in incredibly expensive and they take a really long time. And, and that's just, for a, a, a number of different reasons, but I think, you know, the the largest challenge for all of the emerging sectors of the industry is just educating people um, in, you know, that 
seeing a lawyer is like seeing a doctor. Like, wouldn't you rather see me now, you know, <laughs> or this thing gets really bad and we have to cut the arm off. Like, let's just put a bandaid on and some Neosporin and do some preventative care. So I feel like that's, um, perhaps the largest one well, of the best analogies I've heard in a long yeah. time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, I like that one. I, I like that analogy because I'm, I think I'm going to so. keep that <laughs> maybe, maybe use that on my teenager once or twice. So that's a good one. Um, I have a question in regards to, and we, t we just talked about, you know, Blizz, their announcement with the Overwatch League and things are changing and um, I don't even know if I can react to it. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's such a huge thing. But we know we kind of we've talked about it here on the show many times. We knew that there is going to be someone or some IP that is going to have to you know step up and start making some of these drastic changes because it's warranted in today's society and where esports is moving and growing so fast. Um, my question is, um, how do you feel about traditional sports executives or owners um, that have you know, own NBA teams or MLB teams and even NHL teams securing controlling interest in gaming franchises because it has happened, whether it be esports teams themselves or starting to buy into these leagues um, to get a piece of the pie. Do you feel like this is going to cause controversy and damage to the natural progression of the esports league from a legal perspective because you've got people coming in with a lot of money um, and preconceived notion about making money and it's going to hurt the players and the protection of the players or if like Resolve said there could be you know um, things set in place to protect the player but with this much flux in money and huge names coming in you know it sounds like it's just going to be jumbled up and huge um, and before you answer that let me just say Acid Rain thank you so much for that resub Yay! three months in a row pipe, 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 pipe. Hype. No. Um, guys throw up your phoenix for Acid Rain and we thank you again for donating to our scholarship foundation Rain uh, and just for you Resolve will now do what? what? what do you usually do when Rain subs? oh I have to do a dab on stream you do let's go okay. girl that's part of this there thing. you go <laughs> it's just me though like just she, for you like, she'll donate and she'll be like now do a dab and i'm like okay. sorry and it's we're always from just north carolina me. so when you said i have to do a dab on screen i was like she gonna pinch some dip right now no <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, oh, no no that was good she was like stop it it's not legal you could be in trouble <laughs> Oh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. And then back to you, Mida. Sorry to cut you off, oh, but that's no, a big okay. deal. There was so much in that question, but if I, you know, can, you know, generally ad address it, I think you're right to say that these um, more sophisticated entities coming into the industry is definitely going to bring in an influx of, you know, their ideas from their existing industries. Um, and, you know, that does happen sometimes already, like, for example, when a game developer is licensing music for like a trailer or something like that, we have to talk to music people, music industry people all of a sudden, and they have um, a, a long list of things for their special contracts that you know we just don't usually consider, and likewise with acting people. So I would say that already goes on to a degree, um, and so uh, hopefully, you know, coupled with the education, um, you're retaining an attorney that's, re re you know, ready to deal with that. But I, I do agree with you that uh, the way that those other industries have been handled historically has not been best practices, at least in my opinion. Um, and there's ongoing litigation going on about, for example, the NCAA. I go to UNC. Uh, we have had a lot of academic scandals, for example, with our football program. And just um, I, I think that they're potentially related issues just as far as like taking teenagers who demonstrated a remarkable athletic ability and then sort of funneling them into a system where you're getting a cut of these huge profits that they're generating um, through, you know, advertising and sponsorship and things of that nature. There's a lot of Im immediately apparent parallels. And so I think uh, what it will come down to is potentially your, your faith in the games industry as a unique cult uh, cultural collective. Um, just what comes to mind immediately is um our rating system is like by like double like 10 more than 10 percent 
um, more efficient and self-regulating than any of the other industries like CDs and DVDs and things of that nature. And so we haven't had as many regulations put on us as an industry as other digital mediums have because, um, and maybe just comes from the cultural the cultural background of, of game developers, but I just think historically we have been more culturally and socially conscious about the way that we're evolving as a business uh, industry. And so I, I'm, I don't know, I just think it comes down to a matter of faith and voting with your wallet, you know, because at the end of the day, these companies are entirely fueled by, you know, ad revenue and you're purchasing their actual uh, game products and DLC, et cetera. So, I mean, I just think, again, it always comes back down to, around to education, like being aware, seeing which companies are exploiting their players, um, listening when players come forward and, and say, you know, I was treated this way. And, but also listening to the entire story and knowing that some people are just teenagers that are upset and, and just really taking your time to do the research. I think it's going to be on us as a community to, to, to try to help that process along and make sure that it doesn't stray into the dark path. Um, so it actually turns out my question is going to now be two parts. Uh, and it's mostly just because, um, unfortunately, you just said a whole lot that relates to, like, these two questions. Sure, that's good, um, though, right? It is. So the first thing is, um, I don't know if you knew anything about League of Legends, but a couple weeks ago, weeks ago we talked about kind of the problem with LCS. Um, vis -a -vis Monte Cristo and some of the things he said. And a lot of people have brought up the idea of allowing players to have investment into their own leagues, like, for instance, the NFL does, where the team owners are the ones who basically own the league and those players make all of that money from their own investment with their, essentially, captains. Um, do you think that would be something that would be beneficial to esports players as a whole? Um, I mean... It's hard to say that one particular model would be beneficial to everyone. And what I will say is um, these models are, as far as I understand it, um, always going to come down to a contract that you agree to. So I really would sort of push the onus back on uh, the individuals to know that um, the models that you guys are creating, like, you know, literally yesterday, today, a major announcement was made in this. So, but, you know, part of this hinges upon the participation of these players, including, you know, some celebrity players that are potentially essential to these games. So I would say uh, the ball is as much in the court of these players as it is in these companies, because, you know, we're it's like a symbiotic community right now. That's the ad revenue generated from the viewers which is generated by the player's extraordinary feats. So uh, I, I would say, you know, if I was a player recognizing that these are, you know, contractual uh, relationships, I would consider that, you know. At the same time, though, again, cycling back around to, like, these sports are owned by particular companies. They, you know, they can pick up the ball and go home with it if they want to, and they don't have to let you play. Uh <laughs> get a lot of uh, I get a, a a lot of calls from people that just want access to their game back and it's it's surprising how often I have to ex explain to them that um, they don't necessarily own the game in, <laughs> in the way that they think they do that's interesting yeah. that's interesting um, what a lot of people don't realize that um, digital products are licensed this was like a big yeah. pet peeve of mine in law school once I like because you know a lot of us grew up uh, with the old school mentality of, you know, I bought my N64 game and I have this cartridge and now I can do whatever I want with the cartridge. Um, and you sort of assume that that applies to contemporary purchases that you're making, but that's... And it doesn't. Not what the terms of service say. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty interesting. I mean, I guess you have to come from the perspective of everything that you buy in that capacity has a license or a copyright. I mean, it's like music, you know, or television or logos or, you know, things like that. Um, but it is a hard pill to swallow when you lose access to it. Yeah, I, I've been struggling with that a lot as I had different jobs in the industry. You know, for example, 
when I was a journalist, I got suddenly got very upset about our videos being stolen because we made zero punctuation, which is one of the most popular games review uh, videos globally. And legitimately, like we were keeping the lights on with ad revenue from that show. So, I mean, you're, and there were times when we had to let people go. And it was really hard not to think back to, you know, knowing that 50% of our audience is using ad blocker and know that we could have kept all of those people on to keep making that content. If we could have just explained to them, like, you love our site. You you obviously love it. You're coming to the site. Like, just turn the ad blocker off so we can. But yeah, I mean, that, that was just one time where, and again, working as a developer, that happened to me again, where you're on the content creation side and suddenly you realize, oh, just because it was instantaneous for me to download the game like it took 10 years to make and like hundreds of people and you know just tons of time and effort and sweat and tears and even even though you can instantly steal it it's really hard to see all of that process that behind the scenes stuff mostly because of how cloak and dagger our industry is but yeah i'm gonna resolve would you like okay. to um I'm trying to think of how to word this. Uh, I came across something like a month and a half ago uh, where it, like a studio was going after Steam. They had submitted a subpoena for um, 100 Steam users because of whatever reviews that they had left on one of their titles. Um, like as, as far as like ethics and everything else are concerned, like where in like the development realm should you just like learn how to brush stuff off as like negative comments and where like where is that like that definitive line where you're like okay well maybe i just need to go ahead and like take legal action against said users um was it no man's sky that no it, this was actually against uh digital homicide <laughs> Okay. I did not read this story. So wait, they they were targeting users for defaming them? Appa right? Yeah, apparently there I guess a lot what of happens. There were a lot. Um and he he actually he submitted a subpoena in the state of Arizona in a federal court um against it was like a hundred anonymous Steam users that he wanted all of their information because he was it was like a eighteen million dollar lawsuit apparently. Um, that he was claiming loss of wages, defamation of character, just a whole, like, a whole slew of, like, allegations. Um, but I guess, like, my whole thing is, like, I'm trying to figure out, like, where, where do you learn how to, like, kind of learn how to, like, stiffen your upper lip and kind of just move on with it? And where, where is that point where you're like, okay, enough is enough, and maybe this is where, like, I need to draw the line and have some action taken? Oh man, I just feel like that's just a, a general biz business uh, good good practices question. Uh, no, I I hate to I hate to feel hesitant to comment because I didn't see those particular this is a lawyerly answer. I didn't see those particular comments, so I don't know whether they're um, they were right or wrong in that case. But I will say, uh, in general, I feel like the classy move is not to not to directly reply to those things unless. Uh, Unless you have a responsibility to, because you've done something, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, for example, if if you really did falsely advertise or something like that, I think it, in that case, um, you have an obligation to pursue whatever whatever means in order to sort of clear the record. But I mean, if it's if it's not true and it's not really affecting anything, and and your community doesn't really genuinely believe it, then mm -hmm. I would say just let it let it go. From a and lawsuits are very expensive. I don't think people realize uh, how expensive they are, and especially with defamation lawsuits, um, it's harder and harder to prove defamation um, when some an issue or a person becomes more public or more famous. So uh, those are really difficult lawsuits to get involved in and end up being so fact and opinion specific that. Yeah, it really, I, I wouldn't get involved in, in a defamation lawsuit unless it was really important. And I, I, I was a wealthy company, especially because uh, you have to set aside money for like a lawyer to, I mean, unless you have like a very good hearted lawyer that's just really believes in your case. Um, a lot of people forget that even if you have a legal right to something, uh, you have to be able to afford to enforce that right first, which... 
uh, it's, it sucks for a lot of indie devs because, or, or actually more often, I feel like um, streamers are, are really having a hard time of it right now because the copyright takedown system is so easy to abuse because of how automated it is, especially mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, and so often, even when they're right, um, they're just someone making a video on YouTube and they don't want to have, they can't have a whole lawsuit about it. And so they just let it go. Um, I feel bad for the YouTubers right now. I, I hope that we could do something to sort of help uh, reform the setup they've got going on there. Just because, you know, I also understand YouTube's position. If you guys don't know, like, uh, when you are a website operator, um, you, when you know that copyright infringement is going on on your website, you become responsible for it. So YouTube's way of um, not being responsible for potential infringement is whenever anyone alerts them to potential infringement, they kind of err on the side of believing them because uh, it's safer that way, um, which you know, is risk more risk averse, but isn't really leaning the pendulum towards free speech. Speaking of false advertising, uh oh. Um, have you heard about No Man's Sky and the Advertising Standards Authority for the UK? And what do you think of that? So, I, yeah, I did. Um, I don't know the finer details of it, but from what I understand, um, didn't Steam recently revise their policy as well to require an actual work, a screenshot of your working game now when you submit it um, for this reason, potentially? Um, <sighs> I think No Man's Sky set a precedence with a lot of changes for them um, because they were like, well, crap, what do we do now? We had so many refunds, so many people upset. We can't have this happen to us twice as a business. I the lawyer in me, you know, totally understands uh, you should get what you pay for. Uh, the f former game journalist in me is thinking, how many times have you seen a game demoed that was like a CG sequence that was not at all the actual in-game footage that you ended up playing? And I mean, for me at least, I, but again, I was a reviewer and I had that experience and I understood that as the context and maybe not everyone had that understanding. So that's that's a thing to consider, but. And I think with uh, No Man's Sky, there was, it wasn't just the trailer footage and you thought you were getting something else. It was the context, the gameplay, and the mechanics of the game. Um, it kind of fell into that feeling, and I actually played it they, for yeah. a couple hours. They of, advertised features they did not. Right. Um, so how do you think this this example of, of No Man's Sky has changed the way, the, you know, the that Steam is doing business in this capacity, or has it? I, I mean, my instinct is to say, and I, you know, don't have any, I haven't seen any factual data to, to back this up, but I guess my instinct is to say, again, that more transparency uh, has to be better, right? Uh, and I just feel like in a market where because so many game development engines are free now to access, you have so many more games uh, hitting the marketplace. And you also have, you know, new funding mechanisms like Kickstarter and whatnot, allowing so many more products to get out there. And I think there are a lot of questions being raised about how money is being handled and the ethics of it. And I'm encouraged to see, you know, even though it may be difficult and there may be, it, you know, if I was Steam, I would be frustrated with having this headache, certainly, but I would say for consumers, it has to be better for them. Do you agree, Resolve? I definitely agree. Um, there, there definitely, and I have commented on this before, there needs to be some sort of standard, um, especially when it, when it comes to advertisement. You can't just, you know, be like, hey, we're going to put in this feature and then release a game and you're like, where is it? You know what I mean? And it's just, you know, especially like as a consumer, as a gamer, it's really, really frustrating and difficult to like watch like the, you know, the the previews of games, the trailers and everything else. And you get like super hype. And there was this huge hype train behind No Man's Sky, like to the point where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get this game. And when everybody got it on release day, they're like, don't get it. You're not. And I'm like, why and they're like oh it's it's broken like it's, it's or all over again yeah <laughs> well and i think i think this sets a precedent now that 
when something like this happens, because this isn't the only game that's done it, it's the only game that people have had such a huge issue with that's done it. This sets a precedent that when other games do things like this, that we have some sort of recourse, that we as people are not just kind of SOL. I love hearing you talk about precedent. Maybe you should be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Randoms in the house. Hey, Aegon, thanks for stopping in. Much Latin. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move into our hot topics. And again, guys in the audience, uh, you know what that is. Um, and before we roll into our first hot topic, um, I want to say again, thank you, Rain, for that resub. And uh, those Lord Legends in the house, thank you so much for dropping in the show. And uh, Pixie, you are first. Okay, so I'm really excited about this. Um, everybody knows I love esports. Uh, if Holly were here, she would geek out as much as I'm geeking out over this. Um, so we are going to be having an hour and 47 minute documentary about esports. Yay! This covers way beyond gameplay and game mechanics. This is all about how teams cope when they lose and how they work together as a unit and what goes on really behind the scenes when it comes to esports. Not when they're on stage and the crowd is hyped and everyone's you know, rooting for them. What happens when people boo them and the way that they react to it. It's actually all about Team Liquid. Um, so it follows their North American League of Legends team uh, and their dramatic boot camp in South Korea in their LCS campaign. And it covers the fractions and conflicts uh, as the players and coaching staff kind of struggle to just make the team work. Uh, and I think it's super interesting. I totally just messed that up. Um, I think it's it. super <laughs> interesting. <laughs> That's, that's not the right one either. <laughs> I'll get it. <laughs> I think it's super interesting that this is something that people don't get to see. And having played video games in a professional capacity, like, this is something that is, like, very near and dear to my heart. Because I understand the struggles that people have over this. One more time. And... Do it twice. Do it twice. Sorry, guys. Technical difficulties on the back end. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there it is. All okay. right. I'm just, I'm watching the Google Doc go from like. No, yeah, we were messing around. Okay, do it twice. Okay, there it is. Like, <laughs> the vanishing link. Like... Yeah, so, so it's just, uh, keep it's going, super near and dear to my heart. And I think it's interesting. And I kind of think it's about time because we've had documentaries on the games that we play. And now that we're having esports in such a huge boom, we have, you know, E-League, and we have Overwatch Leagues, and we have the LCS, and we have Worlds, and we have the TI, like, now we're finally getting to see what goes on beyond all of that. And so I'm really excited about it. Um, so, first of all, what does everyone think of this idea? And second of all, Will you see it? And who are you talking to, by the way? Maida, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's Man, excited. I love watching esports documentaries, but I get really sad because uh, I grew up playing EverQuest and World of Warcraft, and I love progression rating. And the whole time I'm thinking, I'm like 25 year old, years too old for this. Like, my reflexes are just done. Every day beyond 15 is just, like, wasted. <laughs> no, but I, I, I really enjoy, uh, I really enjoy following esports stories. I think that would be really exciting. It just makes me wish that I, I was doing that. <laughs> I'm a sucker for a documentary. And when you combine the things that I geek out over and stick it in a documentary, I'm like, get off of the big TV family or you're watching it with me because I got to watch this thing. And the other thing that makes me excited is I can now pull Molly Squinchies into this so that she can watch something that actually is a millennial. She's kind of like on the fringe, not really interested in esports, but it does affect her life because these are the new things that are coming up as sports in her world. 
Um, you know, so there's a whole realm of change that's going on that I really want her to be aware of as a teenager because want someday, one way or another, this is going to affect her in a capacity of a job. I really think it will because this is gonna this is gonna get huge um, mm-hmm. in, in our life and in my life. I'm hoping, but in her life specifically, and you resolve you and and Pixie, of course, because you're younger than we are. Um, it's going to be a thing, and it's going to be. I mean, we already are on national TV, you know. So it's amazing to me when you can combine those things. I'm geeking out already. Um, so I can watch and see the inside, what's going on behind the scenes, what's really happening between the players and the coaching dynamic. Um, and hopefully there's some candid stuff in there so we can really get a feel for how hard this is for the actual players. Because a lot of people take for granted the fact that how many hours they have to practice, the diligence oh they have my to have God, the concentration yes. of being on these teams, and they act like it's a big party. It's not. It's almost military style for them, where they're living in housing. They have a certain amount of hours to practice. They have meals ready for them, but not in a capacity of you think that it's such a luxury. It is strictly work for them. And then also, I would love to be able to see the downside of where does someone go if they have an injury? or if they age out, all those things that are, you know, for any other professional sports player, doesn't necessarily mean they transition over to to casting, right? That doesn't necessarily happen in our industry, those types of things. I think that's important to see the human side of what's going on in the league. Um, Resolve, what do you think? As somebody who now works in esports, this is way past overdue, I feel like. Um, this is this is really really exciting because I, I feel like when you say like oh yeah I work in esports everybody's like oh you get to go to all the major competitions and stuff like like no like nine times out of ten it's not competing you're practicing there's logistics behind it um, there's there's a lot of negotiating there's you know a lot of behind the scenes that a, peop- a lot of people don't even realize they think it's just focused on the games and that's it but um, you know there's there's a lot behind it so. To really be seeing like how the team, I guess, interacts um, and essentially, you know, just lives day to day. Like especially boot camp, like that's that's huge. That's really really big because that's like that's down to the nitty and gritty before like any major competition or anything like that. That's like when your nose is to the grind and you're like you're playing the hardest you've ever played. Um, so it's it's really really exciting to actually see. Um, an esports organization actually step up and they're like, you know what, let's go ahead and do this and show it because, you know, it's not all glitz and glamour. It's not, you know, we're, we're looking our best in our jerseys. We're on stage. Like these guys, you know, for weeks, months, sometimes, you know, they're just, they're grinding out the game to get to the best that they can as far as their ability to be able to compete um, at the highest level. Um, yeah. I mean, it's 10 hours a day every yeah, day like at it's, minimum. Yeah, I mean, like, you're essentially, like, it's 70 hours a week that you're putting in um, to gaming, and a lot of people don't even realize that. They're like, oh, yeah, well, I can play for two or three hours every day, and I can hit pro. Like, no, you can't. Like, it really, you know, like, you have to live the game. Like, you really do. Um, So I feel like, especially, like, trying to explain, like, the whole esports competitive gaming everything like to my parents like if I were to sit down with them like especially my dad because he's always been like kind of like into my competitive gaming and everything else if I sit down and I'm like here just watch this and you'll finally understand it he'll be like wow you know um so it's definitely like on an educational level like for people who don't necessarily understand like they'll realize that it's more than just you're so right about that my boyfriend is the art lead on uh division and Mm -hmm. He, his dad did not understand him being a video game developer until he got to see it on ESPN, like a trailer for uh, Tom Clancy, whatever, you know, or Division, and and he's hanging out with his friends watching, like, the Super Bowl, and his son's game has, like, a commercial, and he's like, oh, I get that, you know what I mean? And we're like, oh, gosh, well, hope you never have to explain working anywhere (laughs) that doesn't get on ESPN. Yeah. (laughs) So let me, go ahead. I was going to go to the legal aspect of things like this uh, topic in documentaries. Um, when a movie or, you know, even YouTube clips or things like these are made, do you, I'm going to go to you, 
would you think that there has to be some kind of release for footage to be used for these players or are they generally when they sign their initial contract open to whatever the league and or the team wants to do with their image likeness and or otherwise um i I mean it definitely depends on the specific contract but i would say it's not at all uncommon for I mean, I would say it's, it, in fact, um, makes sense for players to sign away their rights to their likeness over to the team because part of the team's purpose is to publicize them and to get sponsors for them and stuff like that. And so the only way that they can do that is to to guarantee to some extent that the player is going to cooperate um, and that they can sell them as a, as a commodity. Uh, if I was a player, I would definitely especially if I was a talented player that had some kind of leverage in my negotiation, I would love some kind of approval over that. Um, Final but... approval, yeah. Um, <laughs> do you feel like... Please, uh, sell me your soul when you sign this esports <laughs> contract. Are you so right in blood! <laughs> Wasn't there a company that, I forget who it was, that did that as, like, a educational prank? Um, like, I forgot who it was, but they put in their terms of service, like, you were contracting away your soul for, I think, a day, and then they wrote in emails to all of their users, like, just so you know, you agreed to this, and right. we just think that you should be aware about terms of service and what you're agreeing to. You know, and that's, a, that's another topic in regards to these that's players. That's another thing, too. Who actually reads the terms of service? Me, because I draft them, and then no <laughs> one ever reads them again. <laughs> 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 Do you feel like there should be an advocate for these players that are being recruited at such a young age, um, or um, it goes back to the union, someone to be able to advocate for them on to pre prepare these kids or at least educate them on what they're signing, or um, do you think that and I, you know yeah. not on the back end, you know Team Liquid. And other other teams, do they have somebody like that? That you know, hey, my, if I'm a mom and my kid gets drafted, I have no clue. I mean, I'm, I would know some of body sports, but as a legal aspect, am I able to obtain my own attorney to be able to say, okay, this is what we're gonna do? Or, so yeah, it would be it would be the the player's attorney, but the parent would definitely need to be involved because you know children can't fully legally authorize things. Um, so it kind of has to be with uh, joint consent. And I would say that there's other there's other kinds besides attorneys um, of assistance that you can get. Like um, you could get uh, a talent agent, kind of like actors have that you know maybe not not necessarily drafting a contract for you, but um, helping to be kind of some kind of middle manager um, in between you and perhaps the team owner. And then I think another aspect that people aren't considering yet is uh, one of our uh, attorneys at our firm is a, a college esports coach. Uh, and I think people aren't considering how uh, academic institutions are starting to get involved in this entire process oh, by, for example, having pro uh college esports teams and also having scholarships and full-time staff that are hired just to help sort of shepherd them through their career development process. So I think that's another resource that people don't necessarily first think of, but I'm constantly surprised by um, how expansive that area is right now. I'm going to roll into my hot topic, uh, which kind of fits the theme for the evening, talking esports. And we're going to talk esports viewership versus traditional sports viewership. Um, you know, I was surprised to find out that esports makes up 76% of TV viewing. 76%. Can you imagine that, guys? And, and, and when I say TV viewing over traditional sports, that includes online, right? Because now in our world, TV is no longer mainstream TV. We are watching everything streaming. I think the minority now is watching things live. Um, you guys correct me if I'm wrong. The 76%, that's a high number. I would have not thought that to be that high. I would have thought maybe 50, 76% of esports over traditional esports people are watching. And then also um, we have, again, Traditional sports investors investing into esports. Philadelphia 76ers um, franchise be bought an esports team. Little did you know. That's huge. That's huge. That's major dollars. 
and for I don't know how that's going to roll into one to the other, um, but also millennials age 21 to 35 average watching esports are more popular than baseball and hockey. 22% for traditional sports. Huge numbers, guys. Huge gap. 76% um, viewers over traditional sports. And I'm, I'm inclined to believe them because, hey, when I go to, uh, you know, turn on my TV, I go to Twitch. I generally don't go to, oh, it's the, uh, wait, I don't lie. The Cavs and the Indians as of late. I will turn that on. <laughs> but, um, that Cubs game. I was all right? like, you right for your loss. My boyfriend and said that he pulled it up on his phone at the end. <laughs> it was rough. It was rough. One of our associates was there. All our Skype was just like, bing, 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 Jason, are you okay? Are you alive? <laughs> He's like, this is the greatest day of my life. <laughs> Researchers say gaming brings in innovation and tech and a new consumer business model that is unique ability to engage and actively involve younger generations, meaning the millennials, where traditional sports and traditional media brings experience and advertisers in an effective platform. But when shall the two meet or collide is the better question. Do you guys think that tapping into this new esports market is going to be a good thing for you know our national media? Or is it going to cause a total disrupt in our esports society, and you're going to see a total, you know, rebuild? You know, I hate to say it, but you know, like an apocalypse. Things are going to change, and it's not going to be what we know as esports because there's dollars and influx of money because it's gotten so popular. I wouldn't be surprised if it sort of started to replace traditional sports, just because. I mean. The first thing that I think of, because, you know, my background is in content creation, is how much more expensive it is to have a football game than it is to have any kind of video game match of any kind at all. Um, just because, you know, first of all, you have all the, the, the fact that it's a physical game. You have people using their bodies, getting injured constantly. They all have to go to the same physical place, fly there, get put up. Everyone has to know you have to have a stadium. You have to fill the stadium necessarily, like with fans, because you can't just have like a quiet uh, game. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and I just feel like um, there's so many levels on which it's it's just more complicated and expensive to do traditional sports. That I wouldn't be surprised if just because of the same reason that you know print media is dying off. It's just better business to focus on esports just because if you can if you can have viewership in that avenue and you're not having to spend as much money up front you know in order to create the entertainment i just i would be surprised if one didn't slowly start to um just encompass the other i mean i'm sure and i'm sure there will always be a place for physical sports but i just kind of think of it like sort of like the olympics where you're like oh wow there is javelin throwing like where has that been this whole time I just w I wouldn't be entirely surprised if like baseball was someday javelin throwing. But. What do you think, Rizal? The baseball comment kind of hurts. I mean, <laughs> sorry. baseball and hockey is what I grew up on. Um, but I, uh, I I feel like this past year with the introduction of E League on TBS um, is definitely a testament to it. Um, I my fear is that it's just gonna pretty much blow up too fast and then implode. Um, that's that's my whole worry is that, you know, you see these things that gain popularity so quickly and then all of a sudden there's interest lost in it. Um, but I, I like, I, I'm excited. I, I've highly anticipated the day where I don't just have to be on the computer or pull up Twitch on my Xbox and watch it in the living room where I can just flip to a channel on my TV and be able to watch certain competitions like i i think that's amazing um will it necessarily replace uh the more contemporary sports that we have now i don't i don't think so i don't know but i mean 76 percent is huge 76 that's, that's, huge. that's a scary number oh, like i I, I never would have guessed in a million years that 76 percent of male millennials are watching esports rather than traditional sports 
I, I have to say that I am excited about the day when I can go into my local watering hole or wherever I'm at and actually ask them to change the channel to an esports match and they not look at me like I'm sideways or crazy um, because I want to watch esports and or be somewhere with family and they're like, what are we watching? You know, it's up there. It's accepted. I don't feel ostracized or, you know, anything like that because, you know, you can go and watch your basketball or your traditional sports and everyone's fine. There's only, and, you know, at least where we live, maybe one or two places where you can go and actually watch. Even even with E-League, I can't go to my local bar or wherever that traditionally is a sports bar and ask them to turn on E-League. They're like, what? Why? Where? Yeah. I mean, you can watch from the corner on the little TV, you know, but I don't get to go watch where everyone else is on the big TV because it's not as accepting. So that, to me, is exciting um, to be able to do that. And then also... When that happens, when that tide turns, my fellow geeks and nerds will be flocking to the bar and we're all hanging out together outside of our homes instead of online. That's amazing to me as well. Are you sure you're s still going to feel the exact same way about it at that time? Because I'm finding it maybe interesting follow-up question to like what's going to happen when, you know, when, when, when will our culture blow up is it's clearly happening. Um, and what does it mean that nerds that grow up today and in the near future won't have to ha go through the fire, so to speak, in order to have those interests? Like, because I, I don't know, I'm just finding, I notice a lot just socially within the industry of, you know, young people that are growing up having, you know, always had Facebook accounts and things of that nature where, uh it gets taken for granted they have yeah. a club at school about it you know versus like when i was growing up like every weird kid had to sit at the same table and you had your like theater weird yes kid, you had your painting weird kid you had your gamer weird kid and like everyone had their th and then you <laughs> had that random weird kid that just like ate glue sticks yeah exactly and <laughs> you had to me. hang out with him because you were all the weird the, the i think there's table. still that same type <laughs> Red Hot's got something coming in on the uh, chat. Guys, we're going to pull that. I think there's a, still going to be those same type of clicks and, and different things going on because I'm raising a teenager, and let me tell you, there still is a lot of perception of what's accepted and what's not. And then also the fact that they have never not known anything but a cell phone, right, or all these apps and the things that they're on. So there's still, the, there's still something that's going to be, you know, their hurdle to grasp. But it also has a lot to do with parenting and the style of what's going on in your house to teach your child how to deal with those things. Um, so I guess a bit more of like, um, I wonder how older nerds feel about younger nerds not having to go through this rite of passage. Well, let me tell you as I an mean, older yeah. nerd, because I am <laughs> the older nerd at the table here, and you all know that I don't like telling my age, but I'll tell you that... Uh, Certain certain cartoons that are coming back now was, was my childhood, and, and certain things that are coming back now was my childhood, and I was an Atari kid, so there you go, I'll date myself. So as an older nerd, I am not envious of you younger nerds, because I have a different perception of how I grew up and the things that I appreciate, although there's things about what's going on in your generation that I have no concept or no clue as to why you do what you do, um, <laughs> because I ask myself... You know, because online today is way different than online was for me. When you when you look at how you interact socially or if you're dating or whatever, it's a whole different animal. So those there's always going to be that. Um, but I'm not going to allow it to negate how I feel about something, right? Just the joy like, of something for me. How do I use this Tinder app? <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? I'm going to go ask my husband, how do I use this Tinder app? You know, because he's about eight years younger than I am. Let's just swipe this way or I this way. I am swiping right. I am. <laughs> <laughs> What's it mean when he says... Yeah, no, I just go ask Molly Squid. I'm like, this isn't working to take fit here. I just give it to her. Make it go. What's a filter? So, <laughs> so the thing is, I don't. Pitfall, I don't right, Molly? I do not think that this is going to outdo regular sports. Never ever? Um, at some point, maybe, but I think everyone who likes football and hockey and would rather watch that. Need, like they have to die before that happens. They have Call I'm of Duty. Okay, yeah. there's like game for those people. Like, I, I like I understand 
the, like that's kind of the idea. The problem is, is that when you think of people who are older, typically they're set in their ways or they weren't raised on games. And this is an entirely new area for them that they don't understand. And not everybody wants to make the leap. To I try understand, to understand it. <laughs> I understand it just fine. I didn't. I didn't say you didn't. We're not <laughs> saying you specifically. Like my dad oh, likes okay. to see something, and my dad would never watch Call of Duty. Right. My yeah. dad would be like, you know what I thought, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, I like, get you. Know. And that's the thing, right? Is that. Is you there, say I that, think, but I know like veterans that do play Call of Duty. <laughs> so do I. Like, yeah. so do I. But I know my dad wouldn't. So I mean, <laughs> but I mean that's the thing, right? Is I think I think at some point this can overtake sports. I don't know that regular sports go to the wayside, um, because when you talk about like physical damage that's done by you know sports themselves, esports is actually just as physically damaging as regular sports are because it does a lot of things to your spine and your posture, which cause a lot of problems like cardiomegaly. Um, so the, that's, that's a problem that like we can't address because we can't say, oh, well, like it would be healthier. So like, that's something we have to completely throw out. And then the thing is, is, I'm sorry, I have like a really hard time feeling like a football player does not have like a more rigorous, activity physically i think the football boxing any sports that has a physical contact um in comparison to your body and the damage it does especially when you talk about brain damage and some of the other things i think it's always going to be above and beyond now mental stress i think it's different brain damage is about the same as cervical spine damage um so Wait, 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 wait. Let me go back. Let me go back. Did you just say brain damage is about the same as physical spine damage? Cervical spine damage. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. cervical spine damage. No, you mean in, in the damage to your body or the capacity of lifestyle? Because that's a whole other question. And we're going way off topic, girls. No, just saying so you know, down think, the rabbit hole. It's like important, though. I mean, because if it is true that people are getting as physically injured in these. Um, that would be something that, for example, this documentary would do a great job of highlighting. Because, right. And yeah, we talked about that important. a couple times in, in the yeah, show. And I, mean, yeah. and I mean, psychologically, there, like, there's a lot of damage that can be done. And there's a lot of pressure. I mean, so I don't think, I don't think talking about sports in any way that, like, incurs damage is a thing that is, like, completely necessary because all sports cause damage. It's the levels and the type of damage that are just varying so, and so let me let me just real quickly let you guys know in chat if you want to get in this conversation throw up that hashtag i see red has something he's going to throw in here in a minute and oh oh mg no. resolve what what was that resolve so terrell just hit us with a three month in a row resub uh ladies of the round table for life smiley, awesome smiley art Guys, throw up your phoenix, flipping the bird. Let's do it, guys. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Terrell, thank for you, that three you. month sub and your donation to the Scholarship Foundation. Come on, flipping the bird. You know I love uh, it. Don't make me yell at you. Do y'all, do y'all, and then I think flip off your audience whenever they resub. We do. Yeah. We do. <laughs> yeah. And then I think we tell them to read between the lines, and then you know yeah. it goes from there. <laughs> read between all the lines, guys. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, too, is when you think about people who are, like, raised on this kind of technology, they take it for granted. And so I feel like while esports is going to be popular, at some point esports is also going to be like, oh, I could watch this or I could just watch my television show because, nah. Hey, well, I have to say that 76% tells me that somebody's going to be watching, right? Right. Somebody's gonna be watching, but I, you know, for me, as a personal level, I'm always a lover of live sports. So it's gonna be a, a, a kind of a torn thing. Out, but you can go to an arena and watch an esports match. You know, um, what did Red have to say before we get too far up in the chat? So, okay, Red Hat said one of the great things about esports is the fact that new stuff is constantly changing. We're always getting new games and new game modes. When was the last time a new sport was actually crafted outside of gaming? Esports is definitely the future because of the variety of new content that can be pushed out in a faster rate that pulls new people into it. That's an awesome comment. I'm gonna let, excuse me, 
Excuse me again. I'm going to let Maida comment on that. Do you have anything to add to Red Hot's commentary? Because, I mean, I know it's not a question, but it is a very good point. No, I mean, it's a great idea. I just, I, I kind of, in a way, kind of circles back around to what I was trying to say about, you know, sports versus physical sports. Is just that uh, to, to get a group of people together to play a game with you uh, is, I think, easier than to getting, getting a group of people together to play a sport with you. Just because of, again, you don't have to all be in the same physical location. You don't have to distribute physical goods to everyone, et cetera. So I think, um, to his point, yeah, there's got to be so much more diversity now in the field of sports in general because you can test out all of these mechanics without having to to get all these people uh, on board right in your area. And also that are physically capable of doing all these different things. Whereas, you know, uh, a person can play a lot of different kinds of games without feeling excluded. Which for me, like inclusivity is al always a huge hook in gaming. Just uh, personally, for, you know, for example, just one of my anecdotes is uh, I had at one point in undergrad, um, my neck had been broken. So I was like on bed rest for a few months and uh, it really gave me a lot of insight at the time into what life is like for people that are more permanently disabled just because I couldn't walk or couldn't really get out of bed, yeah, for a few months. So I played Wrath of the Lich King, which was my favorite WoW expansion um, a lot, and nobody knew that I was immobile uh, and they couldn't see me and stuff like that. So I felt like it was, for me at that time, it was just it, so exciting because it didn't matter that I couldn't go along with everyone for the activities like I could do everything that everyone else could do so I feel like in that sense there's just so much more you can do in the digital space uh, than in the physical space well on that note we're happy to see that you're up and moving around and <laughs> yeah, you are so definitely. much better because that could have ended so much worse I got um, very lucky I was 19 so I think that's did you try to do one of those backflips and it just didn't turn out well? I got hit by a drunk driver. Oh, oh that's oh, that's like, even worse. It's the suckiest story, yeah. But no. unfortunately, I was young enough that again, and it was summer vacation, so I had the time off from college, so it didn't end up affecting me. Except that I had this like crazy spirit quest where I, you know, putting things in perspective. Yeah, exactly. Because I was, you know, I was 19. I was at a really big college. I was young and you know, cute and smart and just messing around all the time. And it was a really great reality check to be like, you could have lost everything right now. And at least you're going to get better in a few months. And like, you have all this time to think about what you're going to do. And it, it was a really enlightening experience. And it just really recommitted me to my love of games just because uh, I was so confused about how I was going to stay sane in three months of staying <laughs> yeah. in my bedroom. And the whole time, I just kept thinking, there are so many people that can't get out of the chair, that will never get out of the chair. And, uh, you know, whether they started there or not, like, uh, there's got to be so many other people in this game right now that are here for the same reason as me. And, like, what a really exciting and liberating experience, you know. And, it, yeah, that was a moment where I was just like, I love games forever. If I can do anything in this industry, like, I'll do it. <laughs> Well, like I said, we are so excited to have you here and uh, <laughs> happy that the caps locks got bur the, the the bot just purged somebody. Sorry, guys. I hate the caps locks um, that you could sit with us and have this conversation. And I bet uh, any amount of money that that just lit a fire under you in regards to getting to where you wanted to be and your decisions in life kind of took a different turn after the, having oh, the time absolutely. to think about it. It it. I didn't even realize it at the time, but um, when you graduate from law school, you have to apply to for the bar, which is this incredible licensure process that takes, uh, I mean, it's sometimes up to a year. You have to get like 12 or 15 character references and all this stuff. And as you're doing this complete audit over, you have to put every address that you've lived at since you were 18. And like, just anyway, I'm looking at it and I realize as I'm telling this story, it was like, oh, I, you know, I painted and I mostly just did art and then I had this really traumatic experience and then afterwards it's just like it kind of looks like my resume started literally after that time and just like you were saying I had all this time to think about how I wasted a lot of my other time before before that and right. how I, I didn't want to do that again so 
So our next hot topic is Resolve. So I can kind of a tie-in between the esports and then Mida because you know you're so invested in law. I, I figured that we'd bring this out. But um, the first esports arbitration court has been opened by WISA, which is the World Esports Association. Um, so they opened this court this past week to handle legal issues and disputes, which would be considered unique to the esports world. So instead of you know, having a federal or state court or, you know, over internationally, um, how they would handle their, um, I guess, disputes. Uh, it's all going to be handled by WISA court um, because they're, it's more specialized and more oriented within esports. Um, so although it has been founded by East, or WISA, the court will operate independently um, and will be open to everyone involved in the esports industry. So we're talking players, teams, organizers, publishers, writers, anything that you, if you're involved in esports, you're, you're open to apply, file a grievance or whatever. Um, so for those of you who are, who are not familiar, um, WISA is, or was founded earlier this year by the ESL with the intention of standardizing and regularizing <laughs> regulating the rapidly expanding professional gaming scene. Um, so they promise to work on player representation, standardized regulations, revenue shares for the teams and hopes to further legitimize the sport. So here we go. We're talking again, um, the more legitimacy. So it doesn't seem like it's just, you know, one-sided or somebody's being taken advantage of. Um, so it's, it's anticipated that the court will be used to handle a vast range of issues to include contract disputes, payouts for prize money, distribution disagreements, misconduct within finances and player representation. So there we're talking again. Now we have somewhere where, you know, our players are represented. Um, every issue that's presented to the court will be decided by an impartial panel of three arbitrators, but those who are involved in a case may agree to use just one arbitrator uh, for certain disputes. Um, all decisions will be final and no appeals will be allowed under any circumstance. So if you go and you have a certain ruling, there's no way that it can be appealed. That's, that's mm. it. You're done. Wow. Um, those who are interested in taking their dispute to arbitration court uh, must start the process with a written case submission. And then if they deem it necessary, an oral hearing will take place. Um, so my, like, I kind of want to get your lady's feelings on it. Like, what are your feelings about WISA stepping up to implement this arbitration system? Do you think this is going to be beneficial to the esports scene? Or do you think it'll eventually flop? And do you think it was the right move for WISA to step up and do it? Or do you think an outside organization should have done it themselves? Uh, might I'll go ahead with you so, first. Just to sort of like, as some uh, high level background, uh, arbitration is an alternative to uh, a courtroom, basically. Uh, it is an alter It's an alternative form of dispute resolution is what is referred to. It is also legally binding. Yeah, exactly. So basically, <laughs> it's based in contract law. And the idea is that um, you are kind of appointing someone to be your judge besides an actual judge. Uh, and in that sense, you're sort of saying, hey, you and I as individuals, um, we have the rights to all of, you know, the legal claims that we have or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to put all, put all of our agency respectively into this situation and go to this neutral third party and say, you know, just like in a courtroom, um, here are both of our issues and uh, let us know who's right. And we're going to agree to be bound by whatever your result is. And the difference, you know, from a courtroom is that you're consenting to be bound by this. So you're basically, at the end of it, signing a contract that's binding, binding you to whatever their decision is. So that's just to explain a little bit about what it means to be, um, to what arbitration is. So there are but basically a, a variety of different organizations, um, including like the American Arbitration Association um, that uh, have sets of rules that govern how they do, how they oversee arbitration and uh, also, you know, have different procedures for carrying it out. So basically choosing one of these is a matter of preference a lot. Some people like different rules for different reasons or that's the way you were taught. Um, but I would say 
just in the most general sense, uh, having an avenue of this available that is created with this particular marketplace in mind um, is a step towards it being more useful to the players inevitably, just because like with our law firm, our whole business model is just that uh, it's not that video game law is itself a unique kind of law. It's contract law and it's trademark law and it's business law, et cetera. But it's that we were one of the first companies that said, hey, this is a huge industry and wouldn't it help people if they didn't have to explain what their industry was before they got their services? So I would say that has got to be useful anywhere, it, you know, even beyond our use of it. So going going to an institution, I can't really speak to, you know, whether they'll be their rules that they're implementing are, are great procedurally or whether the individuals running it, you know, have sound judgment. But I will say just the concept of specializing in this field has got to be, you know, more beneficial overall to the community because it means that uh, we're spending time on what's relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sure. what do you think? I'm kind of torn. I'm kind of torn. You know, I see the value add in the regard to having someone who is an expert, you know, in, in what they're doing um, versus a third party or an outsider coming in. And then you, like, you're right, might you have to rehash or re-explain and then other people have to come in. And it's going to be a longer process um, than it maybe needs to be. Um, I think there is something to be said about being first at something. Right. Um, and being able to uh, break down the paradigm, you know, and, and I we've talked about this multiple occasions of having uh, regulation or not. And I think this is a step towards that. Right. Um, being able to get to maybe something to go across the board. But I guess we'll have to see how it turns out. Um, I, I reserve the right to change my mind <laughs> or come to a, a decision as this shakes out. Um, and ultimately, just because they're in um, this type of arbitration doesn't mean it might not go to court, right? It still could. So, um, it depends upon the arbitration agreement. Usually, right. yeah, yeah, most of the time it will. Yeah, often when like money said, is involved, alternative to the courtroom. So, if you're agreeing to go to arbitration, then um, often you've already consented to be bound um, by that. But, but there could be issues. I was gonna say it still doesn't stop someone when large amounts of money is involved. They still may decide. There are some hair splitting things that yeah. you, you can address. You know whether it was conscionable, the arbitration clause, whether it exists. You know, anyway, there's. Right. You're, you're right. Lawyers have a lot of tricks in their bag. <laughs> Um, Pixie, what about you? Okay. So... Uh -oh. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Here's the thing. Uh, I think it's awesome, awesome that we have a World Esports Association. Totally cool. I don't mind wanting to have arb arbitration for players and for companies who have disputes over esports. But what I think is a really bad idea is not bringing that into the international law system so that those people can become familiar with this. The problem is, is when we set up special places to do things, we essentially say that it isn't applicable in international law or American law or Canadian law. We say that it needs its own special thing because it's a unique special butterfly <laughs> and we have to take care of it because if you touch its wings, it's going to die. And that's not the case. Esports is here to stay. It's only getting bigger. I think that we should push it in a way that mainstreams it more so that when we have issues that do need to be taken to a legal court of law, those people are then prepared to handle it. Because if you've never encountered it, you have no idea what to do. You can look at the law and say, well, this kind of applies, but this is a whole new thing. So we need to start bringing it further in. Now, do I think this is a step in the right direction? Yes. But do I think that this should be something that just sits there and stays and this is how we handle everything? Absolutely not. Uh, I think I, it's going to have hope, to evolve from here. Well, and I hope eventually it flops. Okay.
This is what we do. We tell you how they really feel. Guys, get in the conversation in chat. I see a bunch of you in there lurking. Let's go. Throw up the hashtag. Let us know how you feel about Wisa, or maybe you don't feel, but come on. Let's go. Get in the conversation. Um, I feel like there was... I was like, what was that noise? I, uh, stereo was, sound. Stereo okay. sound. It was good. Um, I feel like, Mina, do you have more to say on this topic after Pixie's rebuttal? Um, there was so much to unpack there. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure, uh, I see the issue uh, as far as like, you know, having a new regional system, um, potentially conflicting, I guess in the sense of maybe you're concerned that like it is not going to be a model that can work in other companies because of perhaps like foreign arbitration restrictions, um, which I guess I do understand. But I uh, the other side of that is, again, since it is based in contract, um, that people from other parts of the world could, I, I guess in my understanding, c consent to participate in that tribunal as well. I guess depending on as long as it wasn't restricted by local laws in their country. But my hope would be, you know, to, to your concern that um, this organization has taken that into account and hopefully done their research and in investigated global arbitration policies so that it is a model that could be adopted other places. We will see. We will see. I think this story is still evolving. I think it's, you know, it's new. Um, There's, yeah, I mean, like, this was literally, like, yesterday that they had announced this, so I mean, like, There's so is, much that's well, happening, like, yeah, today and yesterday. This week, I know. It's I don't, I can't get a grip on it, but I think, I feel like the main thing that I want to keep circling back around to is, since these are just in the beginning stages of so many of these organizations, um, it's so easy at the beginning to talk about what your aspirations are, but, you know, only time will tell uh, once the rubber hits the road how people are really going to act, especially with so much money in their hands. So, I feel like, again, it comes back around to faith in our industry and in our culture and in nerds to not want to be jerks to one another and just keep our fingers crossed. And if we see people being dicks, like, not giving them money anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say that, you know, we do have some pretty smart people in this industry already and people that are uh, veteran in the industry and been around for a long time and seen a lot of things uh, change over the course of the last, what, five, ten years as esports have evolved. So we got to give them some credit too, as business owners, as players who are now no longer players but working behind the scenes. So um, again, uh, this is a story that we will stay on top of and keep you updated as we do week from week of what's going on. Um, but now we're going to roll into our We Are So Steam uh, segment of the show where we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics because that's why we are here week after week. Um, and we're going to give you some things that have popped up on our radar that we want to share with you. It's not a full story, ladies. It's just a little bit of the more you know. So we're going to start with Resolve. Okay, so last week, uh, Caterpillar Earthmovers, the uh, employees at the Decatur, Illinois um, facility, volunteered during their annual Introduce a Girl to STEM Day. So this is the third year that they've done this. Uh, first of all, I have to say, why aren't there more major STEM corporations doing this? Um, not just for girls in general, but for kids. Um, I just, I, I find this is absolutely amazing. So Johns Hill Magnet School students, they were seventh graders, a total of 80 of them attended the Illinois facility on the 27th, which was last Thursday. 40 volunteers from Caterpillar Earth Movers representing more than 15 different divisions um, within the plant attended in, uh, the event and, you know, work with these girls. Um, so this is, it's sponsored by Caterpillar's Employer Research, or Resource Group, uh, Women's Initiative Network, or WIN. Um, and the organizations are concentrating on younger students earlier in their education development to help get women more involved in engineering and making sure to promote diversity in all that Caterpillar does. Um, and then essentially the reason why they did that is they said, when we've approached 
uh, young women who are further on in their high school careers, they've kind of already made up their mind as far as what they want to do with their lives. Um, as far as careers, they've already researched the programs that they're going to attend in university. Um, so it's easier for them to make a lasting impact. Um, more importantly, I like on middle school aged uh, girls and be like, hey, you know, this is an option. I don't know if you knew that this was, but you know, these options are here for you. Um, so the young ladies started their day off by engaging in workshops using science, technology, and engineering common with the facility. Um, and then they were split into groups to build mechanisms, assemble towers, and create LED Halloween cards, which I've never done that in the 27 years of my life. So <laughs> um, awesome. So then as a follow through, um, all of the activities that they participated in uh, were linked to careers at the plant. So they would do something to be like, hey, you know, like, if you want to do this, like every day for a living, you can do it here. Like, this is what you have to do, like in order to go to school, to study this, and you could do this every day if you really enjoy it. Um, and a lot of the feedback that a lot of students were giving, like as far as putting together like gear mechanisms or like, we just looked at it as a puzzle. It really wasn't that difficult. So I mean, like when you approach it from that mindset, like you realize that these sort of things are like attainable, which is super awesome. So I was, I was really, really excited about that because you don't hear about that very often. And for them to be on their third year, and this is literally the first time I've ever heard about it is, it's pretty awesome. I completely understand where you're coming from. I'm, I'm chair of my local game developer association chapter. And one of the things we did was this past year, I set up a global game jam site at um, my undergraduate university, in their comp sci building. And I, I like 80 or 90 people signed up for our site. And the first day when we did our intro, I had the producer of Fortnite come and like give this, you know, big intro explaining how to make a game, blah, blah, blah. And we find out that like not a single person in the room knows how to use Unreal Engine, which Epic Games is headquartered like one city over and it's the major hiring um, studio in the town. Not only that, but most of the other studios in the area also use Unreal Engine and like trickle out of Epic. And not only did none of these kids know how to code in the only engine that would get them a job in the area, but they also did not know any of the studios that were around uh, and had never met anyone that worked in any of them. Uh, and I mean, I had prepared this whole thing thinking they were going to be like here, but they were like way at the beginning in, you know, what their information was. And it it broke my heart, but also it was super exciting because I realized I was giving them a lot more than I thought I was, but also it frustrated me so much because I'm thinking all of these kids are at a top tier university for four years getting a computer science degree, trying to get a job, and not a single person in this building has ever told them, go download Unreal Engine for free. There's like major studios like right in your backyard right, right down the road yeah I mean, I it's funny that you say that because until lawbreakers came out like i had no idea that there were really any ma like uh, yeah they're in like North right Carolina. downtown in raleigh yeah yeah um and actually squanch tendo um if you guys watch rick and morty mm -hmm. uh justin roiland who makes that show just opened up a new game dev studio that's half, in, LA, half in raleigh i've been um, following that yeah, yeah. Um, a former Epic person, Tanya Watson, is spearheading the um, Epic side of that. But anyway, just to your point, like, there's 30 local studios here. I know that for a fact because I audited it. Um, <laughs> and it shocked me that, like, there's no relationships with any of the studio, the local um, universities. And um, there's just no real education happening. Like, they're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to just play around for a few years and the worst part is we have such a specialized industry that if you get to the end of your degree and you've taken like one class on everything you definitely do not have a job waiting for you right you're, yeah you're not in anything you're not an animator you're not a uh you know a rigger you're you're nothing and nobody told you that that any was, different yeah that, yeah no oh, i could talk all day about how frustrated i am by that, but I just, I, I just to loop back around as early as possible, just explaining to people that there's a practical pipeline between things that they enjoy doing and real jobs that are literally in their city that they could have. 
I mean, yeah, it just. Well, uh, I'm here to tell you this is what we do as a nonprofit. <laughs> Let me just tell you a little bit about our programs. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for our PSA. Uh, Ladies of the Round Table Inc. is a nonprofit organization who empowers young girls through 21st century technology to engage them in a career opportunity into STEAM. What is STEAM? Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So what we do is we build a bridge um, for kids between 6th grade and 10th grade to be able to showcase these types of careers and let them know that all the shiny things, all the cool things that they see on TV and they see in video games could be a viable career for them. We bring hands-on STEM to where they are, where the need is great. And we also do talks, we do panels, and we go to other organizations and showcase these skills within our network, bringing people like you um, to be able to talk to the kids and t show them if you want to do this as a career, you can do it. Then we also educate parents and we also have a program a mentor program for university students and then we work with our sponsors and our network partners that are working in the industry now to create internships and externships and field trips for these kids to be able to see real life career choices that they could make so this is where your scholarship dollars are going ladies and gentlemen it's not just to see us talk it goes towards helping kids open up their mind and engage them in something that they have no clue that they could do and also educate parents who are still today thinking video games are the devil right it, it happens it's not it's actually a viable career in a form or fashion it doesn't have to be that you are making an fps it could be you're a colorist you could be a designer you could be a coder you could be a legal representation of the ip um parents it's a real thing so I don't know. I know I don't tell you guys in the chat, but if you would mind sharing is the best way to support us. Um, opening up your friends to what's going on at this show, talking to us and engaging with our guest is most important. Um, and I think I'm going to go to Pixie next for her topic. Okay. So you dub, uh, also known as the University of Washington, decided to do a study. <laughs> Uh, it's to be one of the first to delve into why there are gender disparities across STEM fields. So they found three main factors in the disparity, but the most powerful factor they found was a masculine culture. It identified 10 factors that affected your in like a person's interest and participation in STEM. So the three main aspects that were identified as that of masculine culture were stereotypes of the fields that are incompatible with how women perceive themselves, negative stereotypes about women's abilities and the scarcity of role models. So those factors have decreased women's interest in a field by signaling essentially that they don't belong there. So students are basing their educational decisions in large part on their perceptions of a field. One of the studies said, and not having early experience with what a field is really like makes it more likely that we'll rely on stereotypes about that field and who's good at it. So while a lack of experience doesn't itself cause the gap in STEM fields, women are more attracted to fields that they're typically not exposed to before college, like nursing and social work. But when a lack of early experience is accompanied by masculine culture, it typically screws, it, sorry, not screws, skews <laughs> the, the proportion too. to being male. Uh, so early learning opportunities in STEM fields will only attract girls if they convey that girls belong in those fields as much as boys do. Um, one of the things that was also said is if we're not providing students with a welcoming culture, these efforts to close these gender disparities are not likely to succeed. Uh, I just thought it was super interesting. The more you know. And uh, if you would like to read more about the story that Pixie has just told us, she'll throw up a link here in a second. I believe Resolve has some kind of feels. Your hand Do I have feels? Yeah. Uh, I was like, the more you know. The like more the you know. All right. Shooting star. I have, I have some feels about this topic. Um, gender disparity i was the not worst. <laughs> I, I believe it is very negative but i was never the type of girl 
for a young woman to, to have anyone persuade me of doing something just because. Um, but I know that that is not the case for most people. Um, or especially in girls where at a young age to not be sensitive to someone in authority or as in a teacher or your parent to tell you, you can't do that because girls don't do that. I know that wasn't, it's not normal. I'm not a normal bird. Um, so I have a lot of empathy for those who have went through those types of um, negative stereotypical roles and or had those experiences. And it has made me want to do better as an adult in regards to helping others, as well as very sensitive to how I speak to my daughter and or how I project things onto her because she has a different experience than I, I do as a young woman. Um, I would love for her to be as strong as I think I am and or let things roll off my back, but I can't say that that's the case until she experiences something. So we take things as a case by case basis because I would love to tell her, yes, you're gonna do that because you're gonna show them, you know, but maybe that's not the best thing for her and her psyche to, to my mom said I gotta do it. So I gotta stand here and take this. Um, so this is interesting um, study and I think there's something to be said about inclusivity obviously or we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation um, but I think it takes a support system for that to happen right um, I have so many do you have feels on. give us the feels I, well I did not mention but my father is Iranian or he was he passed away earlier this year but he was first generation immigrant and it is incredibly religious and decided to move to North Carolina because that was like the closest to his experience of like being a farmer in the desert. So just as far as like context, have like tech lawyer mom and that on the other side. And so I don't think I've ever seen my dad as amused as the day that he saw me drive for the first time because he thought that it was like a dog walking on their eyes. <laughs> He, I mean, he was happy, but like crying, laughing. He thought it was so cute and weird. And while he always, you know, was really happy for me to go to law school, there definitely were all those moments in Iran where like, like you're saying, I would go there and I wouldn't have the mindset of like, I should do things different because I'm a girl. And then there would be all those awkward moments where like the women have to go sit in another place. And my dad's like, she doesn't understand that. Just let her sit with us. Like, and so, I mean, just my whole life was a lot of like struggling, explaining that conversation and, and not having a lot of support in that regard. And knowing that like, although he would be so happy when I accomplished things, it was never like necessarily expected. And if anything, it was like this weird, crazy, awesome surprise. And so uh that definitely I it was so lucky that I had my mom as an example to sort of balance out against that but even now I, I think as interesting it is to think about you know the preventative stuff I think retention is another issue that people don't think about because for me now um I was a video game journalist that was a very male dominated field and then I went into the practice of law which is far more conservative to the point where it was a controversial topic at our school whether you should be allowed to wear pantsuits because some law firms think that it's inappropriate for women to wear pants. Um, and so I just, every day, you know, although I work at probably the most liberal progressive law firm there ever was, uh, I go into it knowing that I'm working in a field where other people that I'm interacting with are coming into it with an attitude like that. And every day I have to like kind of put on that same armor that I did with my dad, all those conversations of like, I, I want to be a leader. I want to, I want to do these great things with my life. And it's exhausting, even though you're, you know, you have your arguments are sound and you deserve what you're asking for there's just like a, a toll it takes on you having to have that conversation, even if you're not verbally having it, just the posturing of like the power dynamics and all of that stuff. Like uh, it, it just is a lot. And every day I kind of think like, well, I really like painting. Like <laughs> maybe I can do something. Like, Don't settle. Yeah, Don't I settle. Love, I love being an attorney, but you know, sometimes you, you get a little tired of all the struggle. And so Every day I have to, you know, think back to like my mom as this example of someone that came home ecstatic every day knowing that she 
was in control of her life and in many ways in control of the future of a gigantic tech company and remind myself that as hard as it is like you have to hold on to those examples of people that did it and know that like you have to stay there because the moment that you give up and decide that it's too hard you've created a vacancy and now those other people that would have looked up to you and seen that that was possible because you did it and put up with it now they don't have that opportunity so i feel like it's important to think about passing the torch in that respect every day you know <laughs> I always say one of the mottos for me in regards to what we do as a charity is if they don't see it, they won't be it. Um, so, you know, to sum it up in a little short, cute phrase, um, thank you for what you do because you are setting an example for young girls. Um, you, you know, even though, you know, you're younger than me and you are kind of starting out in this form of your career. There are women looking at you. There are young girls looking at you, uh, especially in the capacity of IGDA, which we are members ourselves. Um, and we thank you for that as well. If you guys don't know what that is, then you should. We'll throw up a link and you can check it out. Um, the Scholars Program, can I just say please, that- Please, please. Um, a lot of my career only happened because of IGDA. Uh, I, I didn't know necessarily what my next step was in law school towards getting back into the industry. Um, and I blind emailed Kate and Tristan and just said, can I do anything for you? And they made me their like personal volunteer and helped, you know, I, I worked with them and they helped me get out to GDC where I made major connections. And ultimately I ended up becoming a GDC scholar, which everyone should just, if you want to do anything in game dev and you're a student, go to IGDA, just Google IGDA Scholars Program because they'll give you like a, a couple grand depending on where you live to go to a conference and they'll set you up with a mentor in your specific discipline. They'll give you tours of studios and basically all of these things we're saying like I wish the universities were doing. IGDA has funds set aside specific and they have a women in games fund that's an entirely separate one than their general scholars pool. Um, and I think it's comparable in its funding. So, uh, fun fact, IG Day also offers a lot of discounts and insurance, all kinds of other things to benefit our community and our, gosh, our industry, if I, if I dare say. Kate is one of our board members, so we're, we're very familiar with, with no, I didn't her. Know that. And, she's uh, like my hero. She's everyone's hero. But she's like, like a real life Wonder Woman, I'm just going to say. No, she know. prefers Lady Thor. What she do does prefer like? Lady <laughs> Thor. She does prefer Lady Thor. But I mean, in the aspect of being a, a well-rounded superhero, Wonder Woman is my ultimate. And I know Psy Warrior is going to hear this and like cringe that I, I said someone else is Wonder Woman. But Kate in real life has tremendous superpowers in regards to what she does and her stamina. OMG. Yeah is amazing. Um, the example, like every time I'm in her presence, I think, wow, she has such dignity and grace. And every moment she seems so calm in the room, like <laughs> she's been at war or something and everyone else is just freaking out. And she's just looking at them with her like eagle gaze. Like, I'm just, yeah, we could talk about her all day too. I know, but um, I, I mean, I just, IGD is a great organization to get involved in and really has an investment in helping women place into our industry and professional jobs. And there's so many resources, guys. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Um, and you don't even have to be necessarily in the industry to have a membership. There's also student membership discounts. Yeah, they're like, um, I think 30 bucks. Or it's super yeah. affordable. So take a look, throwing up the link now, get on over and check it out because there's lots of opportunity for you. And if you're thinking about getting into industry, please check it out because a lot of information over there as well. All uh, right, I think it's my turn on the STEM topic. Last one. Let me see how we're doing on time. Woo, we're doing on time. Uh, so I'm going to go through this really quick. I got excited because uh, Minecraft EDU, everybody knows what that is. Educational Minecraft is a thing. Um, but it looks like Microsoft is building onto this program when it comes to students and teachers. Um, they've come out with a new educational edition, which is different from Minecraft EDU, which provides uh, team play for up to 30 students and it allows teachers to enter lesson plans, pictures, has a chalkboard feature, and also can give teachers can give instruction during gameplay 
and it has a single sign-on feature, which is great for privacy and security for schools, which is awesome, and a non-character uh, playable mode for if you're teaching for the educators, which acts as a guide in the game, so you don't have to always be in there with the kids, because, you know, some of the kids don't think it's pretty cool to have their teacher playing the game with them, so... It's pretty awesome <laughs> it's that like you can... having your mom with you. Right, you know, my mom's playing Minecraft. <laughs> so the teachers can set up, you know, the curriculum and set the kids into the game and still be able to watch and grade and make sure that they're doing what they need to do. Um, a teacher by the name of Mark Mangella describes this new version of Minecraft Educational Edition as um, a new awesome idea in this popular game. And he is before this had no concept of bringing this into the classroom his students actually were like hey can we play minecraft and he's like a video game in the classroom so he looked into the different versions and microsoft had a beta version for teachers they could sign up and he signed up for it and got it because it's not released yet and he's been using it in the classroom and he's like this is making so much difference in our kids today in regards to being able to have a dialogue with them um that's not just the basic book textbook and PowerPoint slides or whiteboard that we see today in kids. Um, so this edition is actually going to be available for teachers at the Windows Store for $5 per user license. Um, and it actually is going to be obtained under an agreement for $1 to $2 per year. Which isn't bad at all when you talk about educators because you know little do people know teachers have to pay for this kind of stuff out of their pocket school board's not going to give them the budget necessary for these types of things uh, i live in north carolina I <laughs> um so fun fact on these learning based games the revenue that is expected for this particular game is 4.9 billion by 2019 you know, wow. if, we, if we're using this across education in the United States. So that's amazing. Pretty amazing. Um, so again, when it comes to our programs and our community outreach, this makes me happy because we too can start having this Minecraft educational program in our arsenal. So when we go talk to kids in, in various places, we can actually set this up and they could be learning while having fun. Don't tell them um, that it's educational. So um, that's the more you know in STEM for this evening, and I'll throw out a link in a little bit here so you can get to that. Thank you so much, Fofire, for that tweet. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the show, and again, we're here every Friday like clockwork. Um, Maida, did you have a good time? Oh, I had a great time. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Epic time. Thanks for jumping in uh, with both feet. And uh, we'll have Absolutely. you back anytime you want to come back and, uh, you know, bring your own topic because, you know, we're more than willing to sit you at the table and uh, put us under a shotgun mode and go for it. Uh, guys, thank you so much for following if you hit that follow button and hosting if yeah. you're hosting. You can come back and we'll be the guest. We'll be yeah. the guest, yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, I've, you know, the shoe has been on the other foot before if you guys <laughs> Giggle a little bit. You can just Google me and watch my old awkward escape and snooze videos. Yeah. Can we talk about how they always freeze frame on like you with when your mouth yeah, open? With your mouth like, open. Yeah, it's always the most awkward like situation. You're like, and then they're like, that's your first Google result forever. <laughs> like, and you can't. Uh, I that. um I tend not to watch. <laughs> there you go. Go follow Mida and give her a shout out on the Twitter and uh keep tabs on what's going on. Um we will put this show up on the YouTube for later viewing for those of you who are listening. Uh, and uh, we appreciate you. And thanks for again for those subs. And we'll see you guys next week. Same bad channel, same bad time. Look at Fire with those hosts. No. And uh, don't forget, we got several people in the Lord Nation family doing Extra Life this weekend. Uh, we're going to give a shout out to Terrell, who's in the channel. We'll be doing Extra Life stream. And also DJ Psy Warrior, extra live stream, and over on Beam Resolve, who else is doing extra live? True. Uh, True Elder Phoenix is going to be doing extra life over on Beam. And uh, Red, is Red doing life. extra life or just Red on the stream? I don't know. I think I haven't heard anything from Red. Right. I, I think Carol may actually be dual streaming on Beam and Twitch. So oh, okay. Either way, whatever you're works for you you can view him 
so popular. Yeah, yeah. so don't forget to... Oh, Red Hot is doing Extra Life as well. Right. So don't forget, right. guys. You know, every little bit helps with Extra Life. Throw up your donations. If you cannot donate, by the way, just view, share, hang out. Keep them up for 24 hours. <laughs> keep them company. All right. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. We are out. Dance it out, ladies. <laughs>